welcome to Clayton Church of Christ. We're glad that you're here to worship with us. I'm Esther and welcome to church. If you would like to know more about our church, please visit our website at claytonchurch.org.au. Or if you want to email us, please email us at hello at claytonchurch.org.au. One of the things that I learned during this pandemic is that God places us in specific situations at specific times. At the beginning of the year in March, when the pandemic began, I was given the opportunity to work at a COVID-19 screening clinic as a doctor. At first, I was very apprehensive and very scared because I didn't want to get the virus and I didn't want to transmit it to other people. But one day, God impressed on my heart and asked me, what if I put you here for a purpose? What if your role as a doctor was for such a time as this? I was very convicted and my mother actually confirmed the same thing on a separate occasion. As a result, I've been working part-time at a COVID-19 screening clinic and it has been a very valuable experience for me and it's been a pleasure to work alongside my fellow healthcare workers during this pandemic. Now is a time for us to worship our God. Let's worship together. Good morning, church. Good to have you with us. Our God's the only one who can restore the broken. And we're just going to sing about Him and sing to Him this morning. Come on.
doing so, He restored us all. He restored the ones who call Him. How marvelous. How marvelous. How wonderful. Let my song still ever be. How marvelous. work has in your life and your parents' lives too. So to start off, I'd like to ask everyone, including all the grown-ups listening, what does work mean to you? Is work all about making enough money to buy the things you need or want? Is work just for older people and a place they go to in the morning and come back grumpy in the evening? Is work a good thing or a bad thing? Do you even have to work? The dictionary says that work is an activity done to achieve a purpose or result. That's interesting because it doesn't actually say that work is done only by grown-ups and only to get money. 
So this tells me that even children can do work and sometimes they don't even get rewarded with it for the ching 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 All right, back to the topic. So, what work do you do then? For our parents, it would be their jobs or who they need to care for. But what about us kids? The main one I can think of is kinder or school. Yes, this is our main work. What other work can you think of? Chores at home? Yep. Playing an instrument? Yep. Playing a sport? Yep. Looking after a sibling? Hmm. You looking after me? I don't think so. So we know what the dictionary says, but what about the Bible? One of the first things in the Bible that is written about work is in Genesis 2 verse 15 and it says the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So God was the one that came up with the idea of work. I think this is so we can have purpose and meaning. This means God made work and if God made work it has to be good <laughs> even if it's a little tiring at times or hard or boring or not fun. Wait, 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 wait. Back to the main topic. Now we are all on the same page about what work is and that work is a good thing. Let's go talk about our attitude and the effort we put into our work. I know when I whinge and moan during my math work, it doesn't make anything better. Even if it's in my head and no one can hear it. It normally makes me mess up and get the wrong answer. It makes my dad's face go like this. When I have a positive attitude and remember that God is pleased when I put lots of effort into my work, I usually get things done much quicker and neater and better. Colossians 3 verse 23 says that Whatever you do, work it out with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. When you have the right attitude, then you'll remember that work matters to God and God matters to work. So kids, to summarise. 1. Kids have work to do too. 2. Work is a good thing that God wants us to do. 3. How you work matters to God, and your attitude you put to it is really important. Oh, and remember kids, stay hydrated! Hi, I'm Nick, I'm Esther's husband. If you're new and you've been watching us online for the last few weeks, we've introduced a new virtual meet and greet session. It's on Zoom. And the first one of these is going to be next Sunday, the 1st of November at 11.15. That's where you can connect and get to know our leaders and they can get to know you as well. So click on the link in the description and RSVP and meet us there at the first meet and greet. As part of the new series Pastor Chi is bringing to us today, we're going to try something a little different on Sunday, the 15th of November. We're going to do church on Zoom. That's right, not on YouTube, not on Facebook, on Zoom. It means we're all going to connect in and there's going to be a richness of interaction and discussion. We look forward to this and we're figuring out some of those final details. So look out for an email that will come your way, um, but save the date, Sunday the 15th of November. After this service, if you would like prayer, our prayer team is now on Zoom. So again, in the description below, click on the link to get some prayer at the end of this service. We'd love to hear and bless you through prayer and you can respond to today's message and we'll just have that richness of conversation after this service. Click that link below in the description. Finally, next week is communion. So as you prepare to do your grocery shopping this coming week, don't forget to get some grape juice or bread or whatever elements you need so that we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together next week. That's all the announcements for today. So thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions, just email us at hello at claydonchurch.org.au or call us on 3 If you'd like to get connected as well, we have two other ways. You can sign up to our weekly email newsletter and that you can find that on our website or you can also connect into a life group. All those details are on our website, www.claydonchurch.org.au. And now it's time for tithes and offering. In the Bible, it teaches us to give our first fruits to God and to be joyful givers. 
as a token of appreciation for what our Heavenly Father has done for us, let us give back to God. So let's just pray for this offering. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you have given us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. We just want to give you praise and worship you through our tithes and offering. And we pray that you'll bless this. In Jesus' name, amen. To find out how to give, you can give through our website in the description or you can give through Tithely by downloading the app on your device. To find out what our Sow a Seed initiative is all about and see how you can be a helping hand to those who have been impacted by COVID-19, visit our website at claytonchurch.org.au. Hey, it's time for the kids to join our Kids Church program now. If you're new to our church and have kids, please register them to our Kids Church program by emailing kids.church at claytonchurch.org.au. Now for the ones that don't need to help your kids set up Zoom, let's try something a little different this week. Let's try to do a few stretches in one minute. So let's get out of our chairs, our beds, our lounges, and join me for a quick exercise. So first of all, I'll get you to put your right arm over your left and just hold it there for five, four, three, two, one. Great. And I'll get you to do it on the other side. Five, four, three, two, one. Great work. Now we'll do a bit of twisting. So I'll get you to twist to the right and to the left and to the right and to the left. Great work, everyone. Lastly, I'll get you to find an object that you can hold up. So it can be like a mango or it can be a weight. And we'll push the object up to the ceiling. Ready? For five. Five, four, three, two, one. Great work. And the other side. Five, four, three, two, one. Excellent work, everyone. All right. Is everyone feeling good and ready for Pastor Chi to bring us the new series today? Why don't you take your seats and get yourselves ready? Well, hi, my name is Chi. I'm the senior pastor of Clean Church of Christ. And we just really want to welcome you to our online church experience. Now, if you're visiting us for the first time, I just want to share really quickly the vision of our church. And that is to build disciples who represents Jesus to everyone, everywhere, with everything. And what that basically means in short is that we really believe that Jesus changes and transforms lives, that Jesus cares about everyday life, and that Jesus uses everyday life to shape us to become more like Him and uses it as a platform for us to make Him known to the rest of the world. And that means that your life matters in this mission. And so over the course of this year, we've addressed different topics of everyday life and the difference that Jesus makes to the area of money, relationships, and today we're going to talk about work. The difference that Jesus makes to our work. Now, before you kind of shut off and you go, hey, like, I'm a high school student, and this got no relevance for me, or whether you're a retiree, you kind of go, I've been there, done that, or whether you're a full-time mom as a homemaker, I just want to say this has relevance for you. Because when I'm talking about work, I'm talking about both paid and unpaid work. I'm talking about the front line where, of your life where you spend the majority of your time in those places and with those people, whether it might be in the schoolyard as a teacher or whether it might be at home with your kid and your toddler as a grandparent, you know, parenting uh, or volunteering in different organizations or whether you might be online uh, as an accountant right now or whether you're an assembly line or a medical doctor, those front lines of work really matter. And so we've decided to title this series, How to Make My Work Better. You know, with this COVID-19, a lot of us are in different places in the area of work. Some of us are underemployed or unemployed, and we want to be able to pray for you at the end. But for some of us, you know, we're loving it. Some of us are feeling the stress about it. And oftentimes, we want to make our work better better. We think about maybe if I change my boss, work would be better. We think maybe if I change my job description, my position, the pay grade. But have you ever considered how our faith can make our work better? And so that's what this series is about. 
talking about how our faith transforms and makes our work better by number one. Today, we're going to talk about changing our perspective because God is there in our work. Next week, we're going to talk about changing who we are becoming in our work, you know, uh, as a worker. The week after, we're going to talk about how it changes the quality and type of work we do. And lastly, about the impact and contribution of our work to the love of our neighbor. And so on that 15th of November, just to take note of this, that's going to be a special Sunday. It's not going to be your typical YouTube channel where you kind of click and watch it on your lounge. It's going to be a Zoom Sunday where we're going to encourage everyone to log on to Zoom and we're going to celebrate and have a service together. So if you want to be part of that, you actually have to join our email list. So go to our website or email us at hello at claytonchurch.org.au and we will get you onto that list and we will email you out the details as well as the Zoom link. So why don't we get straight into it. Today we're going to talk about He's There too. God is there too at your work and we're going to begin from Colossians chapter 1 verses 18 to 20. And this is what it says. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He's the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he's first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And this is the word of the Lord. Let me just pray. Lord God, we just really pray that you help us see your vision for our work and how you've called us there and you want to use it to bring glory to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. You know, I've been looking forward to doing this series for quite a while. To be honest, it's about 14 years in the making. You know, I was first trained as a dentist. I graduated from Melbourne University and I worked in Shepparton and Druin in multiple private practices. And the direction of my life was pretty much headed to be a general practice, practicing dentist, right? And probably owning my own practices in the future. But God had a different story, uh, a plan, and I, I was married 24, six months in, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer, and uh, it took me one year to recover, and I've been in remission since. Now, I remember after that one year of recovery, I went back to work as a dentist. And dentistry is great, it's a great vocation, it pays well, there's actually creativity, you know, this, this tooth here is actually filling. Amazing, isn't it, right? It's actually quite creative, uh, and, but it also pays well. And you know what? People actually treat you with some level of respect and esteem because they think you're really smart or something. But, you know, um, but even though it's great, I had a growing sense of discontentment. And long story short, I felt this sense that God was calling me to church work, to be a pastor at a church, because I, I think I just felt this sense of God giving me a second lease of life and I wanted to make him known. And the best way I knew how was to be a pastor of a local church. And so I did. And it's been 14 years now. I started in 2006, one day a week, then I went three days and then now full time and 14 years in total. And you know what? When I first began this journey, I realized in hindsight, I had some serious faulty thinking around faith and work. You see, because I had this thought that God is primarily at work in church work. But I didn't realize that God was at work in all of work. Now, it's not that I was dismissive about other people's work. I mean, I've been there. I understand it. You know, I understand what it's like. But there were certain things and behavior and value system within me that had actually contributed to this belief system, this faulty belief system that God is primarily at work in church work. And this was some of the things if I was to describe it. I think there were some times when I've wrongly viewed some work as more important than others. I think there have been times where I did not see how work is an essential part of people's calling and also DNA. I think I didn't see how the gospel uh, transformed the, the work, kind of work we did, we as workers, but also our workplace culture. I didn't understand, you know, uh, how work is more than just a platform for evangelism, but it's so much more, and I shrunk the world of work to just evangelism. You know, there were times where I even made an idol out of my own church work. But above all else, I had failed to understand that the role of pastoral work was to help connect our Sunday faith to the practices of our Monday work. You know, I've been shaped largely by people like Tim Keller, Tom Nelson, Amy Sherman, people from the Denver Faith and Work Institute. And I want to be able to acknowledge that a lot of this also comes from them. But I remember Tom Nelson giving this pastoral confession. And he said that for a lot of his life, he had given a minority of attention to what people do with the majority of their time. 
You know, there's a study that was saying about committed believers. If they lived from the age of 25 to 65 over that 40 year period, they would have spent 2,260 hours at a church service. But in contrast, in comparison, at work, they would have spent 96,000 hours over that 40 year period. And can you imagine for myself as a pastor, I had given the majority of my focus and energy and time to equip the members of our church for the minority of 2,260 hours of their life, when really I should have repositioned my life and equip, spend the majority of my time equipping people for the 96,000 hours of their life. That's a lot of time and surely that matters to God. And Jesus has a lot to say about it. And since I became a senior pastor of the church four years ago, I made it a commitment and an ambition to close the Sunday and Monday gap, to speak about the where we spend the majority of our life, in the whole of life, with money, relationship, and all the more in the arena of work. And so this series is going to address how our faith makes our work better. And the one way in which it does that is by transforming our perspective. You know, so oftentimes our perspective of work is shaped by our culture, by what the voices of the world says is success and significance, by the pay grade of the vocation and the opportunities that we have. But more importantly, as disciples, we got to allow the Word of God to shape our perspective on work. There's a story about three stonemasons and there was a visitor that engaged them in conversation. He asked the first one saying, hey, what are you doing? And the first mason said, I'm just cutting stone. And as a second mason chimed in and says, I'm making a living. And he turned to the third mason and says, what about you? And the third mason said, me? I'm building a cathedral for God and his people. What a difference our perspective can make that our work really matters. And what we wanna be able to do is see what the Bible has to say about this and how it shapes our perspective on work. Now the Bible is 66 books in one, but it all contributes to one big story. And that story can be captured in four chapters. The first is creation, where it gives us a picture of what life ought to be. And then we see in Genesis 1 and 2, and then when we go into Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned and there was brokenness and what we call the fall, we see chapter 2, the fall. What life is now because of sin and corruption from the fall. And then from then onwards, all the way into when Jesus comes, it's this story of redemption. What life can be because of Jesus, our crucified and resurrected Christ. And then as we get to the book of Revelations at the end, from garden to city, we see this picture of restoration. What life will be when God's reign is fully established. And so what we're going to do is walk through each of those chapters and how that shapes our perspective on work. So the first chapter is creation. It gives us a picture of what life ought to be. And when we open in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, we see this image of God, God the worker. It says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And here, God begins to work and create the world. And we see this image of God as a worker. You know, when you even you read this one line, it says God created the heavens and the earth. I realized that, you know what, for God to do that, this is how he could have done it. God would have painted the colors of the sky and the beauty of the world like that of an artist. God would have added sounds and, and, and songs to the voices of nature and animals like that of a musician. God would have designed the, the mountains and, and the, the whole ecosystem and the, 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 the canyons and the land and the seas with the design of an architect. God would have made the universe with the stars and, and gravity and the, or the pull and push of forces with the precision of an engineer. And when you begin to understand God as a worker, you begin to hear the echoes of God's work through our work. 
And here, what's amazing is that we see this retelling of this story in Genesis 2. God at work from verses 4 uh, onwards. And this is what it says. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth. And get this. And there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the rust, dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. And get this, then the Lord planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. And here, it gives this picture that God is a worker, and then God created this world, and He wanted someone to look after it. He wanted someone to cultivate His creation. And so He makes you and I, mankind, in His image. He made us with work in mind, so that we would use work to bear His image, to rule and look after His creation. In fact, in Genesis 1, uh, 26, it actually talks about that in a different way. It says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. After creating the whole world and this temple of His, He then creates His masterpiece, us. And he says, let us make them in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and gave them this purpose. He said, be fruitful and multiply, fulfill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. And here we gain this picture of what life ought to be by God's design. That God is a worker who created and designed us with work in mind so that we can bear His image in all of creation. Now, thanks Pastor G. That's a great concept, but what does that mean for my life and my perspective in work? It means this. It means that my work ought to be a gift. You see, in the Bible, it says, you know, before the fall, God created two things, instituted two things, marriage and work. Work did not come after the fall. It came as design before the fall. And work is a gift, just like marriage is a gift. You know, if churches spend just the same amount of time and resources and energy to help people with their marriages as they do with work, our work life would be so much better. Because work is a gift. Our work should be seen as a gift and not a curse. But how often is it that we feel like work is a curse? Work is a toil. I just need to get through my Monday to Fridays and live for my weekend. We see that something is a necessary evil that we need to get through until retirement. But yet work ought to be a gift because God designed us to be His workers in His world. The second implication is that all types of work ought to be used to fulfill God's purpose. And here God puts us to look after the earth and He gives us this ability to tend and cultivate the garden. But now, how does God do that? He does it through our vocation. How does God give us our daily bread? He does it through the farmer. He does it through the factory worker, to the, to the, to the baker, and to the transport guy who brings it to your to coals, you know? And so God uses our vocation to cultivate the world to enable human flourishing. And all types of work, not just church work, ought to be seen as a potential call to fulfill God's purpose. Because God is not just in church work, God uses all types of work. There's a saying is that if it's not sinful work, it's sacred work. You know, I have an older son, he's eight, and the other day, a few months ago, he actually said to me, Dad, you know, I really want to be a zoologist. Now, to be honest, I just paused, but on the inside, 
this Asianness started kicking in. He goes, zoologist? Why do you want to be a zoologist? How do you make a living from a zoologist? How much do they earn? Are you sure that's what you want to do? Don't you want to become a doctor? Don't you want to become a dentist? Now, I didn't say any of this out loud. All that stuff was happening on the inside. But I had to then go, whoa, 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 pause. I need to make sure my perspective is not shaped by my Asian heritage, but by my biblical heritage. And God here says that all types of work ought to be used to fulfill God's purpose, even that of a zoologist. You know, all types of work, you know, in the future, as climate change is coming to become a key issue in the decades to come, you know, all the work that we do with environments, climate, all that kind of stuff, it's going to matter to help fulfill God's purpose in caring for His creation. Artificial intelligence is coming and it's running fast towards us and becoming a, 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 an imminent reality. And all that we do to bring God's ethics into that field is going to be so important to fulfill His purpose, to enable uh, God's morality and ethics and for human flourishing because all types of work ought to be used to fulfill God's purpose. And in the second chapter of this big story, we see the fall. We see what life is because of sin and corruption of the fall. And you see in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, disobeyed Him, there was brokenness introduced into the picture. Brokenness between their relationship with God and themselves. Brokenness within themselves. They saw themselves with distortion. Brokenness with relationship to one another, but also brokenness with the physical world. And in all the more in the world of our work. And here in chapter 3, verse 17, this is what it says, And to the man God said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Have you ever felt that way? You're trying to make a living and it feels like it's hard work? It says in verse 18, It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grain. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. And here it gives this picture that when sin came into the picture and corruption, that our work became more toil, more cumbersome. It's not as fruitful as we would expect it. Brokenness was introduced into the world. And all the more in our world of work, we see brokenness in the type of work that we do. Brokenness in us as workers and brokenness in our workplace culture. I mean, we experience it all the time. You might have a really painful boss. You know, and all of my staff, you know, don't say anything. Zip it, right? But you know what? You kind of go, you experience that your boss is not as understanding and empathetic, unrealistic datelines, the, 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 the sales quarter is ever increasing in order for you to maintain your job. There's restructuring happening. There's a political maneuvering that's happening within your work, unethical habits, shortcuts that people are doing, and it's making your work double the amount of work that it needs to be. There's all this pain and brokenness that we experience in work. Now, what does that have to do with our perspective? Well, first of all, that my work helps me understand that my work is frustrating. I should expect it and I can rise above the brokenness. You know, there's this great book on marriage by Paul Tripp and it's titled, What Do You Expect? I love it because it actually talks about, you know, when people get married, he's a biblical counselor. When people get married, there's all these unmet expectations. It's like, I thought you were going to change. I thought you were going to love me for the rest of my life. I thought you were going to lay down your life. But then he just said, what do people expect? You have one sinful person married to another sinful person. Of course, there's going to be unmet expectations. Of course, there's going to be selfishness, self-centeredness and brokenness. Of course, they're not going to lay down their life for you all the time. What do you expect? And in the same way, the fall helps us understand and to expect brokenness in our world of work. Because my work is frustrating. Of course it is. What do you expect? We should expect it. Of course you're going to have politics 
when you put people together. Of course, there's going to be ethical uh, things that's questionable about people's ethics and integrity. Of course, people are going to try and take shortcuts. Of course, you're going to have lazy workers that make your work extra and double when more than it needs to be. But you know what? The fall enables us to have this perspective where we can expect it so that we can rise above it, to rise above the brokenness. You know, the some of the brokenness that we experience that work isn't as fruitful as it ought to be. The brokenness where we feel that the grass is always greener on the other side. The brokenness where we, we, we work like 80 hours where it becomes our bad master and we, we, we sacrifice our family and our time with our kids on the altar. You know, there's all these distortions, there's this disillusionment, there's all this brokenness that we experience, but the fall tells us that we should expect it and in so doing enables us to rise above the brokenness. You know, how many times I've had people say to me, hey, Pastor Chi, you know, I, I, I envy your position. You know what? I can't wait until I work, I earn enough. Then later I can donate my time and then work for non-for-profits. And you know what? I think to myself, I'm going, man, dude, do you know what the Bible says? There's thorns and thistles. There's thorns and thistles in your uh, uh, corporate work as well as there is in church work and non-for-profit work. If you think you're going to get more significance and satisfaction in doing so, you are disillusioned, okay? The grass is not always greener on the other side. But there's this underlying expectation that I can hear. But when we know that work is frustrating, all kinds of work, and if we expect it, then we can rise above it. We can rise above it and go, hey, actually, the grass is not always greener on the other side. Hey, I can actually do that work now. You know, it enables us to avoid the idolatry of work, where we put work as a master, where we gain our sense of um, esteem, identity from it, to the point of detriment to our own health and also to the detriment of our own family. But because of the fall, we understand that that are realities that we have to navigate through, but we can rise above it. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. In the third story, we see this picture of redemption. What life can be in Christ our crucified and risen Lord. And from Genesis 3 onwards, you see God raised the people of God called Israel and He caused them to bless them so they can be a blessing to the nations, but they failed to do so. And in so doing, God sent Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord to die for our sins and to rise again to do what Israel was unable to do. And here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, it captures what Jesus did in its entirety. It says, For God in His fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through Jesus, God reconciled everything. You know, in some versions it says all things, not some things, not only just the souls of man. It says all things, everything. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And here, what it's trying to say is that Jesus isn't just redeeming souls, but He is at work to redeem all things. And He is doing that work today through you and I, His church. You know, there's a great quote by Abraham Cooper. He's a, a theologian in the past, and he said, There is not one square inch of the entire domain of human life of which Christ the rightful Lord overall does not proclaim, this is mine. And what that means is that when Christ redeems all things, God has this purpose. He wants to restore all things and put it under His feet, as it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9-10, to 10, that God wants to say, this is mine. He wants to go into the corporate boardrooms and goes, this is mine. He wants to go to the home that's divorced or filled with domestic violence and go, this is mine. He wants to go to the financial institutions that's doing all this dodgy, unethical maneuvering and shortcutting at the expense of people and he goes, this is mine. He wants to go into the government where we see sin and corruption, when the government should be there to serve the people but instead it's self-serving. He wants to go, this is mine. When God is looking at 
a scientific advancement and he goes, I want to bring ethics into some of those scientific advancement. He wants to go, this is mine. Because every area of life and domain, God wants to reconcile and put under his lordship. But how does he do it? He does it through his church at work. His church at work. How could I describe it this way? Jesus isn't just redeeming souls, but he's at work to redeem all things through his Christ. Now, what does that mean for you and I? It means this, that my work can be used by God to give people a taste of what life can be in Jesus. And I will seize the opportunity to be fruitful in my work. Now, I have my brother living with me and he he used to be a chef. Yeah, he's quite a talented guy and he used to own two restaurants and he used to be a chef in one of them and uh and ever since he's moved into my house <laughs> my 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 my, quali- my my kids uh used to think my, my my cooking was probably like you know seven out of ten it's now like one out of ten you know uh, so i'm gonna have big issues when he actually leaves my house um but one of the things that i used to do is that i have this really bad habit i don't know whether you're one of those kind of people but i used to always taste you know, when people are cooking, you taste, taste, taste. But I have this bad habit where sometimes I taste and like kind of get caught up in it and keep tasting until there's not much left, right? He used to get so annoyed with me. He's like, dude, just wait for the meal before you start tasting. But you know what? In the same way, you know, when we are in this chapter right now of not what life is, but what life can be because Jesus has come. He's enabled us to give the world Sorry, that was Siri. <laughs> uh, he's enabled us to give the world a taste of what life can be because of Jesus. A taste. Because he hasn't fully come, but he has started and he is here now. But he's called you and I in every single domain of our world of work to give a taste of what life can be because of Jesus. And now, you and I can see our everyday work, the opportunities where we can be fruitful to give the people around us a taste of the kingdom of God. What do I mean by that? There's, a, uh, there's a six ways that, that this uh, institute called London Institute of Contemporary Christianity, which I think is really helpful about how we can be fruitful in our arenas of work. It talks about number one, we can model godly character. Isn't that so needed right now in our government? Number two, making good work. Then you know what? If you do dodgy accounting, that does not love your neighbor. But you know what? Good work does. Number three, ministering grace and love in how you go about doing things. Number four, molding the culture, especially of your industry and your workplace. When everyone is kind of gossiping and backstabbing, backstabbing your boss, you don't do that right? Number five, being a mouthpiece of truth and justice. And number six, being a messenger of the gospel. We're going to unpack some of that over the coming weeks. But I want to share two stories. The first is this. There's a story about a hotel chain owner who had come to Christ and he wanted to give a taste through his hotel chain what life can be and adding to human flourishing. So one of the key decisions that he's made was in the TV channels that's made available, he's decided to stop pornography from being made available. Now that sounds like an easy, simple thing, but you really got to realize that that cost him $10,000 a month per hotel. That's about $120,000 revenue decision. But you see, he was able to make that decision because his vision for work is not profit. It's not the bottom line of profit, but for cultivating creation and the world for human flourishing or for the glory of God. And to have pornography available on TV in a hotel chain ruins people's soul. It ruins people's marriages. It causes people to make bad decisions. It is not conducive for human flourishing. But he decided to use his vocation vocation to be a, and his influence to be able to do that. Isn't that amazing? In the last chapter of restoration, what life will be when God's reign is fully established. And this is when we look 
to Christ coming again. And we read in Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 to 5, where we began in the garden in Genesis 1, the garden, we hear we end with a city, a vision of what life will end up being. It's not just a bunch of souls floating in the air. It's a city, a material world where we will be, where creation is restored, our relationship with God is restored, our relationship with one another is restored and within ourselves. And it describes it this way, Verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among His people. He will live with them and they will be His people and God will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain and all these things are gone forever. And here He gives us this vision that I will make everything new. And here, this is a picture of restoration, what life will be when God's reign is fully established. Because right now, we still experience brokenness, but we can bring what a taste of what it can be. But it's only when He comes again will we experience God's work fully completed. And here, what does that mean for our work? That God's work will be fully completed. It will, it's a promise. We know where the story finishes. And so because of that, we can continue His work with confidence, hope, and perseverance. That there will be a place with no more suffering, a place with no more pain, tears, wars, hunger, oppression, and death. Now, I was listening to a bunch of conference uh, on Christian citizenship. And there was this woman by the name of Stephanie Summers, the CEO of Center of Public Justice. And here it's an independent uh, civic education public policy institution, right? And here it equips leaders, uh, it equips citizens and shapes policy and brings social justice. But there were some of the things that she said that really, really spoke to me. Because she felt this call into this vocation of policy writing. And this is one of the things she said. She said, I've got a passion for social justice, but oftentimes it's difficult to deal with that change because it goes beyond just individual heart change. When the system doesn't treat people the same, we need to care enough to do something about it. You see, these changes that needs to happen in the system has to do with policies and not just individual heart change. And this requires an investment of our time and thoughts to do more. A lot of things are law and policy related, not just individual heart change related. We need to create policies to move the needles on injustice at the most local level. But as she was real about it, she said, but policy change is super slow and costly because loving our neighbor is slow and costly. But you know what? The Christian faith has a robust doctrine of sin. So we expect it to see it in our world. Sin is not just individual acts, but systemic injustices. And this requires changes in law and policy. And that is really slow work and requires perseverance. The persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. But then she began to share this. But this is the confidence that my faith has. It shapes my perspective. That God is at the end of the story. It helps me see where the story ends. That every day we can trust God for the result of our work in a world that is so marred by sin. And what we do today, God is not hampered because God does what He intends. God's work will be fully completed. And so because of that, I can work with confidence, hope and perseverance even if I don't see the results in my lifetime. And isn't that what Jesus did? He died on a cross scorning its shame for the joy that was set before Him because He knew that at the end of the day God is at the end of the story. Do you know that God is at the end of the story of your work? Are you losing hope because God wants you to persevere in it? to live it out with confidence and do not give up in weary in doing good because at the right time, God's work will be fully completed. Amen. What is your perspective on work? 
Do you see it as a gift? Do you see all types of work used by God to fulfill His purpose? Do you feel a sense of call in the vocation that you are in right now? Can you begin to see the opportunities to give the world a taste? Are you able to expect the brokenness but yet rise above it? Are you able to persevere and, and have confidence and hope that your work matters and it will be part of God's fulfilling work, completed work at the end of the day when we do our work in the Lord. Amen. The primary work of the church is the church at work. And so what I want to do is give you this uh, series of videos of some of our church members who are at work in different fields. And so I've titled it Church at Work. So just listen in. Hi. My name is Cheryl Skadian and I'm a GP. I've been working as a GP for about 10 years in Hampton Park. I've felt called to be a doctor from a very young age. Um, from a little girl, I always thought that that's what I would do. And when I was in grade six, I wrote in a time capsule that I would be a missionary doctor. After I was a GP, I asked God, I've done the doctor part, where's the missionary part? And God showed me that um, I was right where I was meant to be. He loves the people here as much as he loves the people overseas. And my mandate and my calling is to be here and to be um, his representative here. Early on in the piece, I struggled with being a Christian at work. I, I felt very awkward about it. I just tried to drop in, you know, Jesus, God, church into conversations um, or try to invite people all the time. Um, and I think I was always trying to bring people uh, to church um, but God showed me that I need to bring people to God. And so that really changed everything because, you know, God is a part of my life. And so it just meant that, you know, when God would speak to me um, in um, when I was reading the Bible, um, if the occasion came up, then I would be able to share that. Um, or if people, um, you know, express questions or things like that, you know, I don't have to invite them to church. I can just tell them how to connect with God. You know, I had someone recently say to me, oh, I feel like I would have found a lot of peace going to church during this time, but I haven't been able to because of COVID. And I was able to help her to download the Bible app and show her that she can connect with God herself. And it's things like that, that have been um, a really beautiful way of seeing um, how God works and how it is God's work um, and how much he loves these people more, more than I ever could. God loves them. Some obstacles I face, uh, you know, I think as a Christian um, and, you know, when you read the Bible, you really feel like God's heart is for the unlovable. And so I really try to bring that at work and I really uh, see the people who um, are, are unlovable, are rude, are mean, are non-compliant, you know, it would be really easy to just to brush them off um, and sort of uh, give up on them. Um, but I really feel like it's God's heart to pursue them and love them. And um, I think that can be tricky sometimes because these um, people who are unlovable to me are unlovable to other staff as well. Um, and so that can cause conflict. Um, but, you know, I think that's the beautiful heart of God. So how my faith speaks to uh, these issues is uh, I think I would be really a burnt out and um, maybe angry, cold-hearted doctor if I didn't have faith and I just tried to help everyone in my own strength. Um, but it's because I, I can see that, um, you know, it's with God's love and God's strength that I can, I can love these people. And I guess the other thing is boundaries, understanding that I'm not responsible for changing their hearts or lives. That's God's work and their willingness. Um, my mandate um, and my responsibility is to be obedient to what God has asked of me. So if you can just pray for me to just um, love God more and more, um, because I really think that my work and my, you know, my whole life, everything is really an expression um, of that. It's all proportionate to that. And when I am really, when I really love God and I'm really like on, on fire or passionate, it just, it's just an overflow. So I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cheryl, for that. Uh, super encouraging. I'm going to hear from different people in different spheres, but let me just pray for you, okay? Lord God, I just really want to pray, especially for those 
who used to see work as just a curse or just something to get by. But Lord, I pray that you'll shift the perspective to see it as their sense of calling, their area of frontline of ministry. God, I pray you give them vision. I pray you give them creativity and initiative and innovation, God. And I pray, Lord, that they'll be able to have eyes to see how you are at work in their work and they can join that and be fruitful in that. But God, I also want to pray for those who are unemployed and underemployed. I pray, God, that we know that work is designed by you, God. And I pray that you will speak life into them. I pray that you will give them opportunity, God. I pray that you'll make a way uh, for them to be able to find not just employment, but the work that you've also called them to do. God, where there is provision that's needed, God, I pray even through sow a seed, whether we'll be able to help in that way if they qualify. But Lord God, we pray for your provision over their lives, oh God. And above all else, uh, a step into the calling that you have for them in that area of work. I pray you be with us over the coming weeks as we explore how you can make our work better in the name of Jesus.
that wonderful message and for challenging us to rethink what our work could look like. If God really spoke to you today and touched your heart and you would like some prayer, our prayer team will be on Zoom today to pray for you. If you would like this, please click on the link in the description box below and we'll see you there. Church, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a wonderful service and it was a privilege to worship with you. If you like our service, please click like or subscribe to our channel. If you are new and you would like more information about our church, please email us at hello at claytonchurch.org.au. And if you want to meet us, join us for our meet and greet on the 1st of November. It's been a wonderful day and a wonderful service, and I pray that all of you will be blessed. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye, everyone. Yeah.